Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Timmy Strata, and you're listening to MMALatestNews.com. It's time to roll, baby. What is up, guys? Welcome back to MMA Latest. This is Split Decision, where we recap UFC 250. Amanda Nunes retained the featherweight title, becoming the first ever champ champ to defend both belts simultaneously. We're back here with the lads, Jay, Orion, and Reese. Guys, I'll start off with you, Jay. What did you make of Amanda Nunes this weekend? Um, yeah, I thought she was excellent. I thought she showed almost everything that, uh, that should go into an MMA game. Her wrestling, her takedown defense, her jiu-jitsu, striking, elbows, knees, kicks, anything that she wanted to show, she thrown. She was pretty successful. I think she, she was just dominant. I kind of felt sorry for uh, Felicia Spencer at one point in time. I, I don't know, it's kind of iffy about people wanting the, the towel to be thrown in. I think that's going to be a very hot topic now. Um, but I think she was, she was incredibly tough, but Nunes is just an elite level performer. There's, there's nobody on her level. I thought she was excellent. Yeah, I know uh, going into the fight, there was a little bit of what if Spencer did it. And there was a, there was, it was David versus Goliath, as I said before the weekend. But going on the fight night, it did. Especially with the empty, empty arena, it did feel like almost a sparring session. And Felicia Spencer, again, just almost like what she did against um, Cyborg. She's come up with a higher stock, but lo- lost all the rounds. And it wasn't really a competitive fight. Now, Reese, you made the bold prediction that Felicia Spencer would come out as champion this weekend. Um, do you want to <laughs> defend yourself here? Not in particular. Um, I, think, I think we spoke about it in a preview, didn't we? It's just the fact it's 2020, we just didn't know what was going to happen. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, when she fought Cyborg, a stock definitely rose and it's rose again. But yeah, you could just tell those levels to the game. And Amanda, unfortunately, for Felicia, is just miles ahead, and she's miles ahead of everybody in the women's game right now. Um, but yeah, my prediction was very, very wrong. Yeah, even then, you saw her get. You know, there was a couple of clinches in I think the first and second round, and especially at first round, you're thinking, oh, Felicia Spencer might have a bit of strength here, but then the hip toss came in straight away from Nunes, and then you realise, oh, this is not a competitive matchup here. And even then, there was, there was thoughts of being, uh, you know, about throwing in the towel, but you're still thinking, you know, Felicia Spencer is very good on the ground, and she could pull off something here, but the strength in the, in the, between the two, Nunes had every single attribute. Uh, Ryan, what did you make of Nunes, and potentially what is next for her? Yeah, I, th- I think, uh, as you said, that hip toss when they got into that first clinch kind of showed that this is not going to be competitive because if Nunes wants to, she can take it down. If she wants to, she can keep it standing. And, like, in, in contrary to the Durandamy fight, she just looked comfortable everywhere. It was, like, th- that kind of a performance where sometimes you worry about those that are labeled as the greatest, whether they might get complacent at some, time, some point. But I feel like Nunes doesn't have that. She just goes in there and she shows every time that she is getting better while the competition is quite a level below her. And in terms of, in terms of what's next to her, it's, it's, it's difficult because, like, like I said on the preview, I think it's, it's difficult for Dana and the matchmakers to present those new contenders to her because none of them are doing anywhere near to what, what she is doing. And when, when there was a, Kathleen Vera was the undefeated one, she lost, and she was my, maybe like one of the more obvious ones coming up. So now um, it, it's difficult, but like Dana said at the press conference, there's always going to be somebody next in line, and you just never know when that day is going to be when somebody unexpected um, gets to win. But I think now it's more for Nunes about what she wants to achieve and like where she wants to leave this in terms of her legacy, because she is she can now chase the most wins in title fights, most wins overall, and stuff like that. So I think it's um, it's more about where Nunes' mind frame is right now and what she wants to do next, because I think it's it's more her fighting against herself in the next few fights until she maybe gets the next big fight or a super fight. Definitely, I agree. I think, you know, you see a lot of fighters, once they become <clears> a <throat> champion, they buckle under the pressure of becoming a champion. But Nunes seems to rise to every single occasion she's presented, whether it's at bantamweight or featherweight. Now, we are looking at outside of the organisation. Do you think Dana would book a crossover fight with someone like Clarissa Shields? Because if Clarissa Shields cu- comes in, especially if she's training takedowns and kickboxing and whatnot. If she comes in and beats Nunes, what does it then say for MMA? If a boxing, uh, you know, a boxing champion comes in and beats the, the greatest of all time? It's not going to happen. There's, two, there's yeah, no two ways that. about it. Like, Clarissa Shields, okay, she's a very decorated boxer, but she's not even a better striker than Amanda Nunes. 
It's okay, she has great hands and stuff like that. As a striker, as a whole, she's not on a Nunez's level. Takedowns, she won't stop them. Jiu-Jitsu, it'll be over in a minute. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's pointless. There's nobody there right now for Amanda Nunes in either weight class. So, it gets to the point, and Arian kind of touched on it, like Dana said, there's always going to be someone else. Okay, there might be somebody else, but it's not going to be very competitive. And the only way Amanda Nunes will drop a title in that scenario, I think I said a couple of weeks ago, Amanda Nunes will be champion as long as she wants to be the champion. So, she will fight a lot of lower level, lower half of the top 10, I think. But it's not going to be competitive. She's going to be the champion for as long as she wants. Yeah, I think if I could just add on to that, I, I like how, I find it funny how people, especially that are involved with the boxing world, say that their best boxers just need to learn how to stuff takedowns. And then they, exactly. have, they have the answer for MMA fighters, where it's literally not like that. Like, I don't care if Floyd Mayweather learns how to stuff takedowns. There are still so many aspects of the game. Like, does he learn how to how to um, check leg kicks in enough time not to be affected by that and stuff? Like, boxing is a lot about footwork and, and their hands. And there's just so much more that goes into MMA that, yeah, I think the Shields fight is, I think it's nice for a promotional thing. But Nunes already said she's not going to boxing, or at least not for the foreseeable future. So it would only happen if Shields decided to switch over to MMA rules and I don't know if she wants that either because it's just I feel like there's too much to lose especially at this point in her career too yeah I think it's um I think it's hell of a lot harder to transition from boxing into MMA as you said obviously when if you are an MMA fighter you do have that that aspect of boxing you you know how to strike you can carry that over like we saw with Connor Connor knows how to box and when he went and fight when, when he went and fought Floyd he knew how to box and he did well with it. But as you said, like you can train as much as you want, but uh, I think at the same time as well, you can't gain that experience. You can't get better until you're in the cage with somebody. And when you're someone like Chris Shield, you're not going to go in and have a warm-up fight against somebody first. You're going to be thrown straight in there. And to be thrown straight in there with someone like Amanda Nunes, I think as Jay said, that's, it's, it's not going to happen. It would be unfair on Clarissa. It would tarnish her legacy as well, I think. So I don't want to see it. Remember James Tony? Yes. I yeah. remember he went in against Randy Couture. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. competitive. Couture didn't break a sweat. It's very much going to be the same. I think CM Punk put up a better fight against Mickey Gall than any of these people would. It, it's it's no, it's bad news. Don't do it. Yeah, definitely. I think you know these crossover fights. They're they're nice to imagine, but they don't work either way. We've seen with MMA going over to boxing with Connor. Connor was allowed to do that because he was the biggest star on the planet and it worked in a promotional aspect for both parties there. For Nunes to go with it to boxing, it probably isn't the smartest move for her. And I don't know what the weight of Clarissa Shields is. I'm not, I'm not too big on the boxing side. I'm guessing she's, you know, that 145, 150 range. But it, it is tough, especially, and it's not, it's, you know, low risk, low reward for Nunes to accept Shields in, in, that, in her area. Because if she, again, it's a 10%, it's a what if, and it may not happen, but if it did happen, it does put a lot of, a lot of sort of questions into the sport of MMA. And Dana doesn't want that anyway. But I think the more likely opposition is probably Megan Anderson. And again, Megan Anderson probably is a level below Felicia Spencer. We saw what Felicia Spencer did to her. And both, both of these other ways, you know, Felicia Spencer was on her 10th fight coming into this, where Amanda Nunes was on her 24th, I believe. But, you know, the experience is very much, you know, there's a vast experience dif- differential between the champion and any challenger that comes towards her at the moment. So, I think... Oh, go to sorry. Andre. No, I think, for once, I had this conversation with a friend of mine. I think for once, finally, we can have a statement where there is a definitive go. It's not for debate. The way we have in the men's with John, GSP, whoever. With the women's, there's finally a definitive go. And, and so, like, and I don't even mean to be in any way type of disrespectful to Clarissa Shields and stuff like that, but it's just, you see my point. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure everyone here is in agreement, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah, Megan Anderson's probably uh, a fair show. But I, I actually kind of felt, with Nunez taking this time off now because she's having a child and stuff like that, I thought probably that amount of time would have been good for her to cut way back to 135, to just ease it down. 
you know, but we'll see what happens when she comes back. The, the thing for me with Megan Anderson is, and, and actually most of the contenders that are left there is that, like the popular, like everybody is saying that Spencer is the toughest. Even Nunes said that she's probably the toughest person in terms of taking punishment that she's fought, and we kind of see that from the amount of damage she took with against uh, Cyborg and now against Nunes. You don't put her away. Like she doesn't even get wobbled. Really, she's taking. She's eating everything. So I just feel like she sets that standard in terms of toughness and how how challenging it is for the likes of Nunes to put her away. And I just don't see anybody else that can take that damage. Like if Nunes hits. 90% of that division or the 135 division, they're going to drop, which, which is even like least, less. It makes it less enticing for those fights because it just feels like Nunes can walk through pretty much everybody else. Yeah, she definitely, you know, she's controlling both divisions here and she can control them as long as she wants. I guess the good thing is that the fact that she is going to take maybe a year out, that the divisions can almost reset and rebuild themselves again. I guess we've got Aldana versus Holm coming up. The featherweight rank, you know, they haven't got a ranking system yet. They desperately need uh, someone that can pin their number one and number two on. They need a rankings in there so that the division can grow. We've seen some divisions recently, like the flyweight division, get almost neglected by the UFC. Now, we've had a title fight for a division that doesn't have a ranking system. It does need some sort of injection in there, whether it's promotion from Invicta, whether it's buying fighters from other organizations. It does definitely need a little bit of tending to. What do you think, Reese, in terms of what the future of the featherweight division is? Uh, I think it's tough <coughs> because obviously the division was created for Chris Cyborg. <coughs> and that was that was Dana's project for Chris Cyborg. Um, and although it obviously cemented Amanda's legacy when Amanda beat her, like it kind of obviously it, it ended her career in the UFC pretty much with Cyborg. But as you said, there's no rankings, and that's the only division which there isn't any rankings. So I think although Dana doesn't like to doesn't like to do crossover fights or doesn't really like to you know talk to other promotions, I think you have to you have to get more featherweight fighters in there. Like you're looking the likes of Bellator, I've got quite a few. Obviously, we've got like Liam McCourt on the way up as well. And even if you go over to Invicta, there's loads as well over there. But as you said, it's so hard to 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 find the elite of that division when their champion is Amanda Nunes. So it's going to be hard for that division to really thrive while Amanda's there, as harsh as that sounds. Yeah, I think you know, I think Felicia Spence is com- comfortably number one. And we saw the, the, the difference in class between, those, between the Nunes and Spencer. But, you know, if we move on from that division to probably the, the best division in the UFC at the moment is the Bantamweight division. We had some cracking fights. Alderman Sterling, you know, cemented his place at the number one contender. You know, we've got to see Jan versus Aldo, but how impressed are you by Aljamain Sterling? Very. I was, um, the way he kind of just ran straight at Corey, uh, I think I mentioned in the preview before that the smaller cage, I think, would benefit Corey. Um, but the way the way Aljamain just ran at Corey and had his back within the first 25 seconds and Corey just didn't have any answers for it whatsoever. Obviously, sunk in that first submission attempt, didn't quite get it, but then, was remained calm, kept his composure about him, and just sunk that in. And before you knew it, he was he was out, and it was a hell of a statement. I think I think I think most people agree that he maybe should even be getting a title shot over Jose Jose Aldo, mm-hmm. but he's definitely definitely in line. He's definitely that next that next contender for for a belt, definitely. Yeah, Ryan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I th- I think none of us. In the beginning, we're expecting for it to be maybe that that quick and that one-sided because everybody has been really high on Sandhagen and, and rightly so because he has been progressing very well and like he was as we were saying he was due that big fight but I think Sterling and his development and how he has progressed and now he is really becoming a star and he's so assured in what he did it's um, yeah I think. Dana was asked about the the thing about with with the Aldo and the Jan thing whether it's too it's not too late yet to maybe change that over and then let Sterling have that. But I think I think um, Aldo against Jan in that fight is good from a marketing <clears> point <throat> to kind of maybe build up and sell that fight more and that title more because whoever wins from that from that one is going to be really high on everyone's radars and I think that's a good platform for that division to go in next. And I think yeah, Sterling showed that he is a class above in that division at the moment and he definitely deserves the next title shot yeah like I didn't expect 
I really didn't expect it to go as quickly as it did. Um, I thought it would have been more competitive. I've no doubt that if that fight happened five times, it would absolutely be competitive. I think just at that point in time, Sterling had gone through too much and he felt he was he was out the shot. Rightfully so, as Arian said, he, he should have. Um, yeah, I think he was just a man on a mission that night. I didn't expect it to go as quick as it did, but he looked impressive. He looked smooth. Um, I would imagine if I'm putting on my matchmaker's hat, I would have thought I would have done Sterling and Peter Jan. I still think that fight will happen. I think Jan will be Aldo. But that's that's the fight. That's the fight I really want to see because I feel like Jan's almost like a mini Khabib in a sense. It's like you just don't see anyone beating him, really. But like you said, Mitch, the bantamweight division right now is probably the best division. Um, I mean, look at Cody Garbrandt. He's put himself right back into top five. Sean O'Malley definitely. He should skip the whole fifteen, go straight into the top ten, and get another big fight. He's probably two fights away from a title. You know what I mean? So like, the bantamweight division is sick, and then you still have Dillashaw to come back. You know, I don't fully believe Henry's retired. Um, yeah, man, the division is is stacked right now. Right, so yeah, Aljamain Sterling looked fantastic, and he did put himself into number one contender spot. It was a performance of the night. Another fight that had that had a performance of the night was the returning Cody Garbrandt. He finally lost that free fight losing skid. Reese, what did you make of Cody Garbrandt on Saturday night? He looked fantastic, didn't he? He really did. I was more impressed with Cody than Aljamain. Just purely based on what we've saw from Cody over the last couple of years, a three fight losing losing streak. And there was a lot of questions that I think we all raised when he was working with Mark Emery to see how well his game had improved. I think we all saw it. He was calm, he was picking his shots, he was in and out so quickly. And obviously the knockout that he had was one second to go and it was arguably one of the quickest punches I've ever saw in my entire life. Um, I was definitely more impressed. Cody, for me, was a standout guy from a mini bantamweight tournament sort of thing that we had going on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I completely agree. I think that knockout, that wind-up of the punch must have been, what, three years of him losing all that, all those camps that he's put into, into play. You know, he, he is a former bantamweight champion. Those two fights against TJ Dillashaw didn't go to plan, neither did the Munoz fight, but he did look phenomenal. He looked like the the Garbrandt that we saw against Dominic Cruz. Now, Jay, you just said he should be in the top five again. He's put himself back in the title picture. He's probably one fight away with Sterling being next in line, but who do you see next for him and what, what did you make of him on Saturday night? Yeah, I thought he was excellent. Um, it, was probably, it was probably his best performance. He, there was no headhunting. He was composed, picked the shots, and then I think the only recklessness that he brought into that fight was the knockout punch. Because you see, it was very like untraditional, wasn't it? He dropped down to his knees and came right up and just swung a haymaker. Um, in terms of what's next for him, probably Sandhagen. You know what I mean? Get, get, get him another fight. I'm trying to think who's in that top five now off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'll probably give him Sandhagen or Cruz again. Cruz is coming off a loss. He'll want to avenge the Cody loss, I'm sure. He says he wants to keep going. So, yeah, something like that, maybe. In the preview of Ryan, that we was hoping that Garbrandt would almost go to Gaethje route in terms of being more conservative. You know, he's moved over with Mark Henry for a little bit of training and doing his camp over in, in uh, New York. What did you make of, of Cody this weekend? And are we hopefully seeing the best of Cody? Yeah, I, th- I think he did exactly that. I think that's what Mark Henry did for him is he kind of calmed him down. I really liked to see the, the corner work that he was doing with him. He was really talking to him. They were kind of analyzing the round uh, when, the, when the first round ended. And it was, it was like, it was different. It was just had a different feel to it than when he had Team Alpha Male coaches in, um, in his corner. And I think the, the thing that made his fight, like Chris said, maybe the most impressive is because there were so many questions that were being asked of him and what's he going to look like. And if he loses for the fourth time, what's next? So he very much had his back against the wall and to respond like he did against somebody like a who is who has been in the top half of that division for 
for years now. He's been there, and and so it was it was very impressive. And yeah, I really liked. It, it was very similar to like he did against Cruz because he was very calculated, very good footwork. He wasn't um, overzealous. He wasn't over committing. And then I think he knew he was aware that there is not a lot of time left on the clock. And he was he he was um, if if he was going to throw that heavy punch, he wasn't likely to get punished for it if it didn't work out. And yeah, like you said, that was that was th- three losses in a row and. Uh, a lot of bad times in the making that like that had everything behind it and it was it was beautiful and the, the fact that it was on the buzzer made it even more even more impressive and yeah i think next for him he's like jay said i agree he's top five for sure and he, he, <clears throat> I, I would kind of like him to run it back with munoz in order to maybe get that win back but i just don't think that's that's the, the move for him like that win does not set up that fight i think it sets up a fight closer to another title challenger yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think one fight that didn't leave any questions asked was Sean O'Malley. That knockout against Eddie Wineland, we, you know, up until that Cody Garbrandt knockout, it was knockout of the night, quite convincingly. You know, he defeated a legend or a veteran, should we say, in Eddie Wineland, who's been there, done that. And Sean O'Malley just came in and what a knockout it was again. Left him on the canvas and that is all she wrote. I was, I was really impressed with... Just that whole sequence. I think he hurt him a little bit with a spinning kick to the body just before. And then he fainted that uppercut, which made Eddie drop his hands. And I think like we mentioned with Cody, the speed of that overhand right, which dropped Eddie and finished the fight, was ridiculous. And I think ever since we have saw him come back, obviously he's been the one who's been saying it's a sugar show 2.0, but I don't think you can disagree with that. Yeah, like I think... <clears throat> I think... Uh... I think he got hurt with a right hand right before it. I don't know if it was just before the kick or right after it. But he caught him like a right hook almost. And you kind of just see Wine and just give a little shake or whatever. And then obviously he done what he done with the faint uppercut and the overhand right. But I think for O'Malley, that was the perfect fight to see where he's at. I think that was the perfect test for him because Wineland can shut you down. He is like I know like he's getting on in years in MMA anyways, but he can put a, put a bit of work on you, so I think that was the right thing for O'Malley. Found out where he's at. It's, he can go another level now, so let's keep slowly progressing him. Don't rush him too soon. Don't just throw him in to a killer right, right away. There's someone there that you can market, you can get behind, do it the correct way, and he'll be huge. Whether he becomes a champion or not, he will be a money fight for the bantamweights, I feel, at some point in time. Yeah, because I think uh, I think we saw that in terms of rushing, we saw that with Darren Till, didn't we? Yeah, where you kind of got that big win over Cowboy, a veteran, and like O'Malley's had that big win over a veteran now over Eddie Wineland, and you know he kind of Till kind of got thrown in, and to be fair to me, he beat Steve, he, he, he beat Wonderboy, and obviously he was he was just he, he got lucky with the terms of people not wanting to fight Woodley and circumstances, but as Jay said, I think we, we do need to be careful with O'Malley because there is the talent in the lad is ridiculously good. Um, I do think he does have it in him, but we mentioned before, like that bantamweight division is so good. Now it's really time to see how good Sean O'Malley is and to see where he, he fits in that division. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, he's only 25 years old. It, it can almost be forgotten at fight's age, especially when they have, you know, quite, I think he's got like 10 or 11 wins on his record now. He's had a fantastic career up to this point, including that suspension as well. We forget how good he could have been if he had three years or those two extra years to have fights and gain experience. But I guess that has almost allowed him to rejuvenate himself and really put in that work inside the gym. You know, you can either go one way and say you can either go one way and say you're taking two years out of the sport pretty much and train pretty lightly, or you can use those two years effectively and really, really grind your game, really upgrade your skills. Now, I think one person, or one fighter at least, that looks like he's been thrown in the deep end was Chase Hooper. Chase Hooper got his first professional loss, 20 years old, and he fought a very veteran Caceres, and he didn't have the greatest night. He didn't get knocked out. He took a lot of damage. Very similarly to Felicia Spencer. Ryan, what did you make of Chase Hooper and Caceres' fight? So, I was very sceptical about it, even last week when we when we briefly touched on it at the at the end of the preview. I just I don't know. It it didn't look right to me because one Caceres is 
like like he he's not the highest rated fighter. He's I don't even think he he would count as a gatekeeper because I think he might be even a level below that. But in terms of experience and just overall game, it just didn't it just didn't sit right with me because especially for for the kid's second fight and. What I learned from that is his striking didn't look at all improved from his first fight. He just looks uncomfortable, uh, and and he just wasn't able to get him down to the ground and do what he wanted to do because he was just overall Casares was just overall better on it. I think the best man on the night won, and it's it's yeah, it's a difficult kind of thing now because where does he go from here? Maybe the loss will be a blessing in disguise because if he manages to get Casares to the ground and submits him, they push him even higher, and then he just gets a bad beating. If he gets an, an opponent that is really serious and near near like the the ranking side of that division, so I think it's just back to the drawing. He just needs to keep polishing his skills because obviously he has the size, he has the he has the ground game, but he just needs to be a little more complete if he wants to get to the top. Because you know that featherweight division is the, the higher you get, the the more the more quality you you come across, and there's some of the best fighter in the whole company in that division. So. I think maybe like the two-year uh, hiatus for Ho- for um, for O'Malley might have been a blessing in disguise because he wasn't pushed too far and he was able to just yeah. kind of sit back and train. Maybe this loss for Hooper will be like, okay, there is still a lot of work to be done. There, you have a base there to start off with, but there is still a lot of work to be put in before you're you're a serious threat in that division. Yeah, to add to that, you know, Chase Hooper he is only twenty years old, and I. I saw in the cage, when they were in the cage, there was a bit of a size difference. He did look almost like a boy versus a man. He's still growing into his frame, let's not forget. He's 20 years old. He's probably going to have a bit of size to him. He's probably going to end up one day being a lightweight or even a welterweight when he reaches Casares' sort of age at that 30, 32 mark. But I think, yeah, I think the loss of doing good, it almost came in too soon. It, he could have probably avoided this with one sort of almost competitive close to his level if they wanted to slowly bring him in, you know, he is only 20 years old. You can see what they've done to Darren Till. It looks like they've learned that from their mistakes and they're looking like they're going to build O'Malley up slowly. But, you know, a loss can make a, it can make a fighter. If he, if he takes a year off, it looks like he's training with, uh, you know, Ben Askren asked him to do some takedown lessons with him and that got a, a slide dig of saying he got his mum's chin after after going back and forth with what's going on there, which is quite funny to see that they've taken it in, in good stead but yeah I'm interested to see where Hooper goes from here because he is a talented fighter on the ground he just needs to get that striking growing but he is only 20 years old so he's got the whole the whole game ahead of him still Jay what, do you, what did you make of that? Yeah pretty much kind of what Arian touched on like it didn't look anything new to me and I think it was generally the best thing that could have happened to him was this loss because he takes time. Now, I don't think he needs to take a year off. But just, you know, prioritise your training structure now a little bit more, you know, on what you feel needs to be added to your game. Bring that forward and showcase it with a certain level of opponent. Now, it's like you said, it's a good thing he lost now. But if he went two, three fights unbeaten and then fights a top 10 fighter and then loses... But then he's kind of his push is stopped a little bit, and then they kind of forget about you. Whereas with you staying that little prospect zone and keep building and keep building and keep building, you get better, you get better, you get the top fighters, you get a top five fight, you get a number one contender fight, you get money, big money. So I think it was personally the best thing for him. The, the one thing that I ask of his development is that the UFC have had him, I think, under contract since he was 18, right? Yeah, yeah, they sent him away yeah. for uh, build-up fights at LFA, yeah. I think it was. I ju- it just doesn't look like he has... May- maybe he needs to do more work at the PI or something like that because it just doesn't feel like he has progressed that much since he broke out on the Contender Series. Whereas you would expect for the UFC to sign him on that contract and maybe help him develop and nurture him a little bit more. But it just kind of seems to me like... I think that card was a perfect example side-by-side of somebody that's being handled their development has been handled very well against somebody who was pushed a little bit too quickly with him and O'Malley side by side. But like, yeah, the age, his age is very much on his side because there is literally zero rush for him to, to go anywhere high right now. He just needs to keep, keep improving. Yeah. I, I just want to touch on that last bit you said there, like as we said with O'Malley, the time since we saw O'Malley on a contender series, the, the level that he's now got to, compared to as you said with Chase like they've been with the UFC for kind of a similar time about four years now 
Um, well, obviously, um, O'Malley's been with him for four years, but the, the level that Chase is at isn't quite ready for the opponents that he's been fighting, like like Caceres. Like, Caceres' record is very, very underrated in terms of, obviously, he's got a lot of losses. Um, but, yeah, I, I was definitely one of the ones who was surprised to see that fight booked. But, as we've said, I think that loss will be good for him going forward, I think. Yeah, definitely, I agree. I think we're going to see, hopefully we see a big star in Chase Hooper. I think this could be a career-defining moment for him. And if he if he uses this time wisely to learn and get back to the drawing board and really develop his game, he, he could become a big star. And-